This stress-free moment's brought to you by Lewis Jewelers. Thank you to all the frontline and essential workers that have made it possible for Washtenaw County and Ann Arbor to open again. Welcome to the Wolverine.com podcast. Clayton Safey here with Austin Fox. This is the Maze and Blue Breakdown for this week. Uh, remember to head over to the Wolverine.com. Use promo code BLUE60 if you're not a subscriber already. You get 60 free days of our premium content. We got EJ Holland, our recruiting guy on the road. This weekend, he's going to see some top targets in the Northeast, including a commit in Dominic Judice. Uh, so keep an eye on his premium stories, all insider notes from that trip. But um, yeah, Austin, I mean, it's it's Thursday here. NFL is back tonight. We got the Chiefs. We got the Texans. It's exciting. Football's back. Um, man, a lot of Michigan guys on the Chiefs. I'm excited to watch. I can't wait for Sunday with a full slate. Um, Saturday, got some games in college football, but obviously no Big Ten. It's mostly just some ACC teams and some group of five teams playing. But, you know, a couple Big 12 games in there, man. Not as excited for that. I'm excited for NFL. I hope the Big Ten comes back as soon as possible because then then the juices will be flowing on college football as well. Yeah, I've said many times on here over the past year or so that I'm not a big NFL guy, but I am looking pretty forward to the NFL games and the full slate of games this weekend. You've got the Lions kicking off at 1 o'clock on Sunday, and you've got a handful of good college football games on Saturday as well with Florida State and Georgia Tech and Duke and Notre Dame and Syracuse and North Carolina. We'll talk about those later in the show, so I'm looking forward to watching these games, but at the same time, it's going to be Very bittersweet knowing that there is no Big Ten football right now and no Michigan football, and it just doesn't feel right. Yeah, like you mentioned, we'll we'll talk about those games. We're bringing back our picks that we did every week last year, and it was kind of fun because we would talk about a Michigan game, preview the next Michigan game, and then give our picks. This time, uh, we don't have those Michigan games, but hopefully as soon as possible we can get those back and uh, we can talk about Michigan games and then give our picks for other college football. It makes all of college football so much better when you have Michigan football, when you have Big Ten football. But, again, we're hoping for the best there. And on that note, Austin, you were at the player protest. The the parents set up last week on Saturday, uh, Labor Day weekend, and set up by the Hutchinsons, the Kemps, and the McCaffreys. And... Your takeaways from being there, what was the vibe like? I know it wasn't a huge turnout, but you did get Jim Harbaugh, the head football coach there. You got Jack Harbaugh, who gave a speech, Chris Hutchinson with a speech. I know Peach Pagano, Carlo Kemp's mom, gave a speech, and and you guys marched through the streets. And like we said last week, um, were you holding your JT Barrett with short sign? I I, I, didn't see a picture of you doing that, so I'm, I'm disappointed. I was uh, holding that sign and wearing the JT Barrett short uh, shirt. So that was actually the biggest takeaway from the protest this weekend. But the turnout honestly wasn't very good. Only about 15 players on the current Michigan football team showed up. A lot of the guys you just talked about, Aiden Hutchinson, Carlo Kemp, Andrew Stuber, Dylan McCaffrey, and a handful of others. Jim Harbaugh was in attendance and a handful of parents. We started out at the Michigan Stadium Tunnel and then they marched over to Hoover Street and then onto State Street and wrap things up at the Michigan Diag, which is in the central part of campus. And that's where Jack Harbaugh gave a short but inspirational talk telling the team to stay together during these tough times. As Bo preached back in 1983, it's all about the team, the team, the team. And these are the times when you really have to come together. And he said that we'll work through this and we'll eventually get through this. And he's right. But with that being said, it's just difficult when you have so much uncertainty and you don't know where this thing is going. Jim Harbaugh was visibly frustrated when he talked to the media on Saturday. He said that he has not had any communication with Michigan President Mark Schlissel despite his texts and emails. And he said that Ward Manuel, the Michigan Athletic Director, is the one who always speaks with President Schlissel throughout this entire ordeal. He said that, Harbaugh that is, said that the team, all they need is two weeks to be ready and they can be playing a season in two weeks. He said he has heard that mid-October is a possibility, but that he simply doesn't know. He said he has no inside information on this situation, even though he has been on every single Big Ten conference call with the head coaches. There have been rumors that he was not present on some of them, but he uh, 
shot that rumor down on Saturday. I actually spoke with Chris Hutchinson as well, who is an ER, ER doctor, uh, Aiden Hutchinson's father, and he said that it is safe to play and these guys should be playing and there's no question in his mind that they can make it work and that it's actually safer to be playing football as opposed to these kids not playing football and instead going to parties and social events on campus. I asked him if he's had any contact with President Schlissel and he said none at all and he was clearly frustrated as well. So those were my main takeaways from Saturday. I think that it was a bit lower key than most people expected. I'm assuming they hope to have a better turnout, but uh, yeah, those were my main takeaways and I don't think it really registered on the national radar. I didn't see any uh, big outlets or ESPN or anything talking about it, but it's really just everything we took away from Saturday is what we already knew in terms of the frustration with the coaches and the parents and the players, and they don't have any answers, and they don't know, know where this thing is going, so they're in the exact same boat that we are right now. I thought Jim Harbaugh showing up was a huge, huge statement saying, you know, because there's obviously disconnect between Mark Schlissel, uh, Ward Manuel, and Jim Harbaugh, and, and Ward Manuel and Jim Harbaugh are aligned on the fact that they want to play, it is safe to play. Michigan football has had over a 1,000 straight tests with no positive Corona tests. So, I mean, you are, you're talking about a team that is healthy, that is staying safe, that is safer than the rest of the student population. If you look at not just Michigan, but around the country in the positive tests that you have at, at schools when they're testing, when they come back to campus, Michigan football is probably the safest place to be right now for anybody. You're getting tested all the time. You're getting your temperature taken all the time. They have strict protocols in the building. When you are at practice, they're implementing face shields over the the helmets. So, I mean, we're talking about probably the safest group of people in the country right now. Um, You could literally argue that. So it's insane, in my opinion, that they're not playing. And it's kind of a disgrace in a way that Mark Schlissel hasn't discussed at all with Jim Harbaugh. Maybe he's texting him back. I think Jim Harbaugh was implying in that interview that, Mark Schlissel really hasn't texted him back. He said he's been texting Mark the results, and uh, Ward uh, talks directly with Mark Schlissel. He was implying that there's been no real communication between the two. We don't know exactly on that, but, man, to me that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You made a huge decision. It's one of the biggest decisions you can possibly make to vote no on Big Ten sports. I mean, it's never been done. It's unprecedented. Michigan's had fall football since 1882, and you haven't talked to the head coach of the team that this most impacts, the team with the most players in that athletic department in fall sports. So it's interesting. It is disappointing, in my opinion, and I agree with Chris Hutchinson. It is safer to play, and, man, it's it's disappointing to say the least that Mark Schlissel hasn't been to the football f- facilities, really not only – during these times, but we've heard from several players, including Aiden Hutchinson, Tyler Cochran, that he has never really shown up in that building that they've seen over the last four or five years. So it's it's crazy to me, man, that we're living in crazy times that somebody like that can make a decision for people that, you know, he really doesn't even know or, or doesn't even talk to and, and doesn't understand uh, the risk reward decision. He doesn't understand the reward of it and hasn't even tried to understand it. So it's very, very disappointing. But um, you know, maybe Mark Schlissel has some data that, that the rest of us don't know. We, we don't see a ton of transparency. So there's a possibility he's holding on to some data that, that shows it's really not safe to play at all. And, and I would love to see that and, and would be on board 100 percent with that if, if he had that proof. But uh, it's very interesting. I thought the protest didn't register, like you said, on a national level, but it did register on a local level, and I think they were really just trying to send that message to the university community, to Ann Arbor, to the Big Ten community, and, and most importantly to the president's office, that they want to play. They feel like this is very important to them, and it obviously is. It's important to a lot of us for these guys to be out there and playing. And, you know, I think it sent the message they needed, and Jim Harbaugh showing up is exactly what it needed to be. I think around the country, everyone knows that that these Big Ten teams want to play, but it sent more of a message to the university, in my opinion, and, and did a good job doing that, especially with Harbaugh's presence. But, man, I mean, it sounds like there could be a revote in the next four or five days here. I know we've said that before, and a lot of people have. And these are good sources, too, that are saying that. But at the same time, 
you know, the sourcing on this, like I said last week, is is off because it's the president's making the decisions. And, you know, sports writers and, and people like Dan Patrick, who I'm sure is a good source, but they have a good sources in the sports circles, athletic directors, coaches, et cetera. They don't have the source with the university presidents. I don't know who does at this point. You know, it's kind of their own world over there, especially because, like we said, Mark Schlissel hasn't talked to Jim Harbaugh. So, you know, Jim Harbaugh was right. He doesn't have any inside info. He's not going to be one of these leaks. But uh, I think the pressure is on from the ADs, from the coaches, and we'll see what happens. Maybe there could be a vote. And Michigan could be back playing in October, possibly November, possibly January. So at this point, it's just a matter of getting that data to the presidents and figuring out what happens, Dawson. But, I mean, there will be football again at some point within the next probably six months. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens here. And hopefully they can get those rapid tests and present all that to the presidents here. Yeah, I don't think that Schlissel or any of these Big Ten higher ups have any hidden information on this whole thing that isn't being released to the public. My biggest takeaway from Saturday in regards to what Harbaugh said was the fact that he has not had any interactions with Schlissel. And I don't think that's okay. Just from a common courtesy standpoint, if someone like Harbaugh, uh, one of your one of the biggest figures in your entire university is sending you texts and emails and you just simply don't respond, I think that there's an issue with that. Uh, Ward Manuel has gotten a lot of criticism over during his time at Michigan from some fans, but I think he deserves a lot of praise in this situation because reports have surf- surfaced that he's been one of the biggest proponents in making this thing work and really pushing this thing to work and trying to get Michigan back on the field. So props to Ward Manuel, props to Jim Harbaugh, and props to these Michigan players and parents who are doing everything in their power to try and make this thing work and then now rests on the presidents and the higher-ups in the Big Ten on their shoulders and for them to change their mind. But unfortunately, I think that stubborn is a very good way to, to describe these people, and I don't see them changing their minds anytime soon. Yep, so we'll see what happens with the season. But again, this too shall pass. We shall uh, get back to football at least at the University of Michigan and the Big Ten soon. The rest of the country, most college football teams are playing. It is safe for them to play uh, down there. So, man, we'll see what happens. The only other bit of news in the past week uh, significantly was Marcus Allen, four-star wide receiver out of Northmont in Clayton, Ohio. Great city there. He decommitted from Michigan, one of four wide receiver commits, now only three. You got Xavier Worthy, Christian Dixon, and who am I forgetting? Uh, Andrell Anthony. Andrell Anthony. There we go. So you got three left, and now Michigan probably opening up their wide receiver recruiting. But Austin, this was a bit of a surprise. Not as much so if you look back at his tweets from a couple of days ago saying, go where you love or go where you feel loved. Um, that could have been a tweet trying to convince another guy to come to Michigan. You never know. Well, turns out it was. You know, he might not have been feeling the love, I guess, even though uh, he had said he's been in constant contact with the Michigan staff. So kind of a head scratcher there. And, uh, you know, again, um, farewell to to Marcus Allen in the class of 2021. And Michigan will move on and look at guys like Jaden Thomas down in the south. And I know E.J. Holland had a great update on what Michigan's looking at. As far as wide receiver recruiting, they're looking to add one more and make it four again. But Uh, Marcus Allen, a a big-bodied receiver out of Ohio, no longer a part of Michigan's 2021 class. Yeah, and I think it's worth mentioning that he was bumped up to a four-star recently from three-star status, so I think this one stings a little bit more to fans because of that. And even E.J. Holland, our recruiting guy, admitted that he was caught off guard by this one, and he didn't see it coming because he was just in Ohio at his and Rod Moore's football game uh, the other weekend, like you mentioned. So uh, it makes you wonder what all went on behind the scenes if there was a falling out between Allen and the Michigan coaching staff, Rod Moore. uh, Like I said, Allen's teammate at uh, Northmont Clayton High School, who was also committed to Michigan, gave a kind of interesting quote on this whole situation. So it does sound like there was maybe a little bit of tension. I don't want to speculate too much, but... Regardless, we wish Allen the best and hope he ends up at a school where he does feel loved, loved like he tweeted the uh, the other day on Twitter. Yeah, I mean, I guess, right? I mean, you know, I mean, we had heard that um, that you know he was he was getting a ton of attention from the Michigan staff and and um, 
but at the end of the day, I guess he didn't feel that love. So, so we'll see uh, where Marcus Allen ends up. We'll see what Michigan does with wide receiver recruiting. Uh, another interesting thing on uh, on the fort, our message board over at the Wolverine dot com that we saw and wanted to answer. I mean, if you were an AD, how would you present the information to the presidents? Uh, was the question, and I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, you know, we talked about it there about the protests and about the fact that as of now, the big 10 will not play this fall. You know, obviously that could change, but how would you present that to the presidents? Man, I'd, I'd present all the data, the testing results, especially if you're at a place like Michigan, where it's been nearly flawless in that football building, but I'd present all of that. But at the end of the day too, I'd present stories from players and, you know, not only former players, but current players about how much football has changed their lives and, and the opportunity to play the game has changed their lives. And that's why I think someone like Chris Hutchinson has such a high authority on this because um, you have a guy who understands it as a doctor. You have a guy that understands it as an all American college football player, as a professional football player, understands what football can do. He also has a son on the team. So he wants what's best for his son. If he, as an ER doctor, thought it wasn't safe to play for his son, Aiden, I'm sure Aiden wouldn't be out there. But guess what? Aiden is out there. And obviously, I respect anybody's decision to opt out. But um, I think guys like Chris Hutchinson should be heard. I think guys like, man, I mean, look at even I know Tom Brady's busy right now. But look at him. If he didn't have his fifth year senior season, who knows if he even goes in the sixth round? Who knows if he even gets a tryout. He was talking about if, if he doesn't get drafted, he was going to be uh, selling insurance like his dad. So, I mean, there is so many stories. Joe Burrow tweeted that he would have been a sixth round pick or a seventh round pick if he didn't have his senior season last year at LSU, of course, won the Heisman Trophy, went number one overall in the NFL draft to the Cincinnati Bengals. So countless, countless, countless uh, stories that you could point to and say, why football is so good, even if there is a little bit of risk. And, and I, I do disagree with that, that there's more risk with this coronavirus being a football player than not being a football player. And I agree with Chris Hutchinson that it's actually safer in that bubble they're in. Um, but your thoughts, how your ward manual. OK, you walk into Mark Schlissel's office. What is your strategy? This feels like we're beating a dead horse, but <laughs> we've talked about it so much lately, but if I were Ward Manuel and I was presenting a specific case to Schlissel specifically from a Michigan standpoint, in this situation, you have to show him the 1,000 straight negative tests that Harbaugh mentioned on Saturday because what more are you looking for? That's exactly what you want, and that's what Michigan has received. Every player is testing negative, and that's exactly what you need. You show him how the football operations are being run and how safe they are and how the protocols are being followed. Uh, so I think that's your... You have to approach it from a data and a statistical standpoint with these Big Ten higher-ups because I don't think they're interested in hearing about how meaningful football is to a lot of these guys, if we're being honest. I think all they care about is the numbers and the statistics and the data, and that's where a guy like Chris Hutchinson comes into play, an ER doctor in what was one of the most infected regions in the entire country down in southeast Michigan. So you bring in medical professionals like him who have been at the front lines and you have to hear what they say because, again, they have an outstanding understanding of this entire situation. So you let them present the data and the facts and you let them explain why they feel it's safe for these kids to be playing football this fall. Yeah, no doubt. I thought that was interesting. I, I do agree. We're kind of beating a dead horse there, but uh, let's move on and do some picks. Let's take a look around the country in college football this weekend. And before we do that, a reminder that this podcast is brought to you in part by JFQ Lending. Our picks are brought to you by JFQ Lending with interest rates below 3%. There's never been a better time to lock in a low fixed interest rate on your mortgage. You'll never need to think about refinancing again. Set it and forget it. And with JFQ Lending, you're guaranteed to get the highest level of customer service. They have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and over 3,000 five-star reviews. Give Josh Yoder a call today at 480-378-0498 or email Josh directly at jyoder at jfqlending.com. JFQ Lending Incorporated Equal Access Lender License in over 40 states. www.jfqlending.com 
dot com. Austin, we mentioned some of those big games. I, I guess I wouldn't say big games, but decent matchups uh, at the top of the show. And let's get into a couple of them that we want to pick. Uh, Thursday night, tonight, we got UAB in Miami. Miami, a 14-point favorite. I'll go with the Hurricanes because I don't know much about UAB other than the fact that they're 1-0 and and they have played a game and, and gotten a win. But I'll, I'll go with the Hurricanes here. I think Manny Diaz will have his team ready to go and, and maybe a little resurgence once again for Miami this year. This really surprises me that the spread on this game is only 14 and a half. UAB must be halfway decent if that's the case. Like you said, they already have a game under their belt. But a reason that some people are pretty high on Miami in the ACC Coastal Division is because of transfer quarterback De'Eric King from Houston. He's expected to be an absolute stud in that Miami offense. So I'm going to go for a uh, much larger than 14 and a half point victory for Miami. And I think they get it done by 20 plus tonight. All right. Saturday at noon, ACC Network, UNC against Syracuse, North Carolina, a 23 point favorite. I know nothing about Syracuse, but I will take them to cover 23. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take some points in a week one game during the coronavirus, and we'll say that North Carolina is not the well-oiled machine that some expect them to do and, and even compete in the ACC. Um, I'll, I'll take Syracuse. As Lee Corso would say, this one is not so fast, my friend. This one is going to be much closer than the experts think. I can't believe North Carolina is favored by that much. Uh, Mac Brown has turned that program around extremely fast, and they have one of the best quarterbacks in the country in sophomore Sam Howell. But they're not going to take down a conference opponent by more than 22 points like the spread indicates. So this is going to be a fairly tight one out in Chapel Hill, and I'm going to say North Carolina wins by 10 or so. Yeah, so we agree. So there's no not so fast, right? Oh, I'm sorry. You said Syracuse will keep it closer as well? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah That's that was completely my fault then. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, yeah, you got to save the not so fast for, for a good time. But 2.30, Notre Dame and Duke. Notre Dame, 20-point favorites I'm seeing here. Give me the fighting Irish in this one. I, I do think Notre Dame with the third-year starting quarterback and Ian Book, a really good offensive line. They got some defensive pieces that are returning. They got some transfers coming in. And, man, I'm going to go with Notre Dame here. I think Notre Dame's going to be a good team. I think they're going to play in the ACC championship game. And something no one's been talking about is, you know, Michigan hasn't gone to a Big Ten championship game yet since it started. Notre Dame's never been to a conference championship game. They've never won a conference championship. So this could be a first for Notre Dame. But we got to start talking about how Notre Dame really hasn't had a ton of success in the ACC. Man, it sounds like you're on that Notre Dame bandwagon. You're uh, your second favorite team in college football, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I Unfortunately, I agree with you on this one. I think they're going to crush Duke. David Cutcliffe has had some good times at Duke over the last 10 years or so, but this is not expected to be a very good Duke team. I think Notre Dame wins big. Duke does have a former Wolverine on their roster and Jameric Woods at safety. So for that reason alone, I'm rooting for Duke big time in this one. That reason alone, right? Sure, and no other reason whatsoever. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Three thirty, Florida State, Georgia Tech, maybe the best matchup of uh, you know in terms of could be a close game uh, of the entire weekend. Florida State, twelve and a half point favorites at home over Georgia Tech. I mean, who knows what Florida State is going to be. Under Mike Norvell, I'm going to go with Florida State, though, minus 12 and a half at home, and, and we'll see what happens with Georgia Tech. Who knows about either of these teams, or at least I don't know much. <laughs> Remember when Florida State was relevant in college football under Jimbo Fisher? It really wasn't that long ago, but, man, they have fallen off big time in recent years. Like you said, it's the first game of the Mike Norvell era down in Tallahassee, so you really don't know what to expect from the Seminoles. Georgia Tech got off to a horrible start last year in year one of the Jeff Collins era. They went three and nine. So I don't think either of these teams are expected to be very good, but I think it's going to be closer than that 12 and a half point spread indicates. I think Florida State wins a tight one, but if we were picking upset specials today, like Lee Corso loves to do on college game day, Georgia Tech would be my pick for this weekend's upset. Okay. And uh, Clemson Wake Forest, I guess we'll finish with this one. This is the primetime game. I believe we're getting Chris Fowler and Kirk Herbstreet, or at least Kirk Herbstreet. Um, 33-point favorites, Clemson at Wake Forest. Give me Clemson. I just feel like there's been 
they've wanted to play. They're gunning to play. Trevor Lawrence even tweeted today, like two days until we play. So that kind of makes me think that he's going to be geared up and ready to go and a possible Heisman Trophy winner, the favorite at this point, especially with Justin Fields not having a season so far. So give me Clemson. Give me Clemson big by 40 plus. If it spreads 33, give me Clemson by 40 plus. I hate to agree with you this much, but I'm going to agree with you again, man. I think Clemson rolls Wake Forest. If Wake Forest still had quarterback Jamie Newman, who put up huge numbers last year before transferring to Georgia, I would like their chances a lot better in this one. But yeah, good for Trevor Lawrence, man. I'm not a Clemson fan or a Trevor Lawrence fan, but props to him for sticking this thing out and deciding to play this year when a lot of other stars around college football aren't playing. So I couldn't agree more. Clemson by 40-plus, and it's going to get ugly fast and out in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I know. It's too bad. That's the primetime game, but we'll take what we can get, and then we got a full slate of NFL on Sunday. So enjoy football, everybody. Uh, man, keep going. Hopefully we'll get some Big Ten football soon, but enjoy the NFL. Enjoy the rest of college football this weekend. We'll talk to everybody next week. Reminder to head over to thewolverine.com, use promo code BLUE60, to, and also to subscribe to this podcast. Again, we'll see you next week.